Okay. So this is how it I'm works. I'm here. I'm here. I'm not infinite, but I'm here. <laughs> All right. So our first our first presentation today is by is from Andrea Colwelty. Colwelty. And it's called Tips for Using Ancestry's Library Edition for 19th Century Biographical Research. A graduate of Oberlin and the Juilliard School, Andrea Colwelty began her career as an operatic mezzo-soprano. Um, the recipient of numerous prizes and awards, including winning the Met competition, she has sung with the New York Philharmonic, the New York City Opera, and the Columbus Symphony, among others. An abiding interest in the history of musicians led her to the New York Public Library Music Division in 1985. During her tenure tenure there, tenure tenure there, she processed copious music-related archival collections and managed their work-study program. Kowelty moved to Chicago in 1995, retiring from the operatic stage to become an archivist for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra where she processed the catalog and cataloged the Theodore Thomas Music Library. When the symphony archives were reduced in 2002, she became a cataloger for the Ward Collection at the Loeb Music Library at Harvard University. This position moved to the Houghton Library in 2006, where she remains at this time. She has an MLIS, MSLIS from Drexel University and has previously presented for MOOG on cataloging bound volumes of sheet music. Um, just a note, we'll be holding questions until Andrea is finished. And then at that time, we will go through the process of, um, we'll, we'll go through the process of uh, doing our Q&A thing. Okay, Andrea, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, great. Greetings, fellow MOOGers. Uh, I'm uh, not being infinite. I'm afraid this is going to be a very hard act to follow in Kevin, but uh, <laughs> I will do my best. Um, always a bit nerve wracking to go first with a new program like Hoppin, but uh, let's see if I can make it work. Yep. You got it. All right. Can anybody right. see Tips on Ancestry Library Edition? Yes, we can see it. All right. I'm Wonderful. Gonna, I'm going to be leaving okay. the screen. I'll leave you to your talk. Thank you. I'm sorry? I'm going to be leaving the screen. Okay. All right. Uh, somebody please shout if they can't hear me or if something goes awry with the presentation, okay? Uh, these days, uh, DNA is the first thing that many think of when you mention ancestry. Spit in a tube and they'll send you an outline of your ethnic background. Sometimes, as in the case of my friends the Mahoney's, you might get an email about possible close relatives. Their story has a happy ending. Their mother got pregnant at a very early age, never mentioned to any of her kids, and gave the baby up for adoption. The Mahoney family was reunited with their older half-sister through ancestry in a miracle of fate and science, and they couldn't be happier together. Those of you who have seen Skip Gates' program, Finding Your Roots, will know how important and emotional this has been for African Americans and others with enslaved ancestors. Finding one's homeland can be such a powerful key to personal identity. On the other hand, you might discover that your cousin is a serial killer, so the jury is still out on the DNA program. But the more pertinent part of Ancestry for our purposes is its online access to transcribed, searchable historical genealogical documentation. Originally assembled by myfamily.com, ProQuest created an online resource available for both individual subscription with extensive personalized functions and options, and the Ancestry Library Edition, a somewhat simplified version, which provides access to historical documents and photos, local narratives, oral histories, indices, and other resources in over 30,000 databases 
dating from the 1500s to the 2000, 2000s, excuse me. Some of our libraries uh, subscribe to Ancestry Library Edition, and needless to say, it is a boon for music catalogers and authority librarians. But getting started can be pretty daunting. So today, I'm going to provide some quick start tips for those of you who have always been interested but intimidated by the interface. We'll investigate options in the card catalog, a listing of all the individual specific record collections, and some basic search tips. My library is now buying a lot of 19th century music and ephemera composed by and or performed by African Americans. And perhaps your library, uh, your libraries are as well. So I will also provide an outline to some resources which I, I found helpful in researching these creators and performers. There are a lot of links I'll be throwing around here, so I've created a Google Doc for a quick reference with a bit.ly address of moog underscore ancestry underscore tips. I've also included additional links and explanations in this doc for your searching pleasure. Many confident searchers start right into the general uh, search page. Sometimes that works all right, but for the usual kind of results list, not so well. Let's try my friend Ann Adams. Hmm, 43,794 results. This is the point at which people often abandon ancestry. Instead of leaping right into the general search, let's take a look at what is actually possible in terms of searching. I recommend that before you begin, always check whether your individual will even be represented in the ancestry. The card catalog, or as it's listed in the menu, new collections, they are exactly the same thing, is where to start. Many new searcher, searchers aren't aware of how powerful this part of the database is. Now, I usually just skip to the keyword search, but I can see where the drop down sort menu can be helpful. You can browse by database title or organize record collections by the number of records within collections. No need to waste your time on the one hit record wonders. Now, the larger collection genres can also be of great use, depending on which kind of records you need. These can be filtered along the left side of the screen interface. The record collection titles aren't always the most intuitive, so limiting a browse search to birth, marriage, and death, for instance, can be helpful in orienting yourself to what is included in the search. The collection, location, and date filters are all faceted farther down the card catalog page. Each of these three filters are faceted further within each link, but just remember to clear them once you want to try a new search. The number of records can be quite important as it will give you an idea of how complete the indexing has been for any particular record collection. Use this information to decide whether any given record collection is likely to include the records you want to see. Unless you are sure of the exact title, I'd recommend starting with keyword. You can also discover record collections that you weren't aware of using keywords rather than exact titles. Some record collections are split up by date ranges. And didn't I feel silly once searching harder and harder for a record which was actually in the later set of record collections. Let's say you know exactly what genre of records you want to search. You can open any one of these record collections and search it separately from the general search collection to better focus a common name, for instance. Limiting the pool of options can help a lot to find birth or death dates with which you can then limit a general search. When getting started, it's a good idea to page down on the individual record collection page to the about section. 
which provides specific details about the contents. Information is always our friend and will help retain your sanity when you can't find a result you just know should be in there. Particularly important to check on German and Italian collections I've found when researching in the 19th century. Generally, I've had the best luck with American and British collections, but there are selected collections in a wide variety of other uh, countries. This can be super important, like in the case of the 1890 US Census, most of which was tragically destroyed in a fire. Don't waste your time searching for something which simply isn't there in the first place. Identifying some possibles to help narrow your results is the hardest part with common names. Keep in mind throughout that there are two moments in the life cycle of these documents where transcription errors might creep in. When the initial documents were filled out, often by a third party who might mishear or misspell information provided orally, and when current transcribers are deciphering faded, often unfamiliar handwriting. I usually don't include middle initials in my first searches, as I find that initials are among the most frequently incorrect elements. I'll begin with a 19th century woman who compiled a volume of sheet music. These women are among the most difficult for us to identify by way of the usual resources, as the vast majority of bound volumes we have in our libraries were compiled by middle class women who have otherwise vanished completely from the historical record. But using ancestry can provide us with a surprising amount of information. Birth, marriage, and death records are the beginning and often suffice for our cataloging or authority purposes. But we can find census records which can track where individuals lived, with whom, and whether they listed any kind of occupation. Less frequently, we can find wills which include a vast amount of information about the status and life of an individual, as well as their living context. Professional, social, or educational organization records are more commonly available for men, but they exist for women as well, and also provide more color commentary. Searching for compiler Mary Bartlett in the general search interface netted me 94,265 results, not including family trees, even more than Anne. So since there are a lot of seller stamps from Boston in this volume, I'm going to try for a Massachusetts birth record and see what I get. When working with bound volumes of sheet music like this, with a gilt stamped label on the front cover and a relatively common name, I include a date filter. This volume has an outside printing date of 1840. So I go on the assumption that a woman compiling a volume would likely be between the ages of 15 and 35. So I'll add a filter of 1815 plus or minus 10 years. If I get no possibles, I'll widen my date filter later. And there she might be. Of course, I need to examine the record, compare it with its digital surrogate if there is one, and look for more confirmation information. The gold standard would then be to go back into the general search armed with any extra information I have found here and see if I can find three confirming records. This isn't always possible, but I'd like to try just to ensure that none of the mistakes mentioned above have crept into the one record I find. So with all of this in mind and fully aware that I may have the wrong person altogether at this point, I try a general search, still without middle initial and entering the birth year with one or two years of cushion, just in case. Birth location, Massachusetts. Now I get 70 results, a much more manageable number than the 94,265 results I got initially. After browsing through the results, I decide to add the initial to the search.
and get a neat set of five. Note the view links, which open out into a scan of the original document. It is always worth checking these out, both to check the spellings of everything and to look for more details. When searching for performers or composers, for instance, that profession area is invaluable for figuring out whether you have the right guy. I see that Mary has now moved to Danvers, which is a northern suburb of Boston, where she has clearly been buying her music. She is looking more likely as the owner of our bound volume. Another important resource in the suggestions is the suggestions Ancestry provides algorithmically to the right within individual records. These may be correct or they may be wrong. Each needs to be assessed individually. We'd need to do more work to be sure that this is our Mary, but we've got a good start. You'll notice what looks like a married name in these suggestions. This is another peril when searching for younger women. You may immediately identify the woman by her birth name, but what happens when she gets married? Fortunately, marriage records often provide that all important bridge between two names, and you'll need that if you try to find a death date subsequently. Now let's go back to the general search screen and examine the way this interface works. Many of the same filters as in the card catalog are here by collection, location, and date ranges all around the edges of the search interface. When you type into any of these search boxes, additional filters will pop open. The date and location filters are self-evident, but the name filters are quite a bit more complex. When limiting to exact matches, Records that contain a last name that is exactly what you typed will appear in your results. Soundex is a common algorithm used to generate alternate spellings of a surname. If you choose this option, any record that contains one of the Soundex variations for a surname will appear in your results. There are other name matching algorithms that Ancestry can use to help identify records to consider for your results. If you choose Sounds Like, Ancestry will identify appropriate algorithms that apply to specific data collections. And if a record has one of those names, Ancestry will return it into your search results. For example, if you are prioritizing Jewish collections first, Ancestry will default to the Deitch Makot uh, Makotov, I knew I'd do that, phonetic algorithm. Similar, there are alternates and spelling variations that are commonly used, such as Kolti for Kowelti. No, really, I'm serious. If you choose this option, Ancestry will return records with these alternates as well. Initials. Sometimes individuals in records are identified with just their first initials or the initials of their given and middle names. By including the initial option, Ancestry will return records that just have initials in the first name. So if you enter Mary, you'll also get records that have M as the first name. You can also use wildcards, asterisk and question mark in your searches. The asterisk will match any number of characters and question mark will match a single character. You may use the asterisk and question mark anywhere in your search text, but you must have at least three letters in total. So asterisk O-W-N is a legal search, but asterisk W-N is not. I'll include an example of this later. You can use wildcards within exact matches. If you choose the Soundex, phonetic, or similar options and use wildcards, then Ancestry will only apply the wildcards to the exact matches. I've put a link into the Google Doc to more detailed explanations of name search options. 
As an example of the capabilities of fuzzy searching, this is my great grandfather, George P. Kowalty, whom I had looked for in the past partially unsuccessfully. It took our very own Robert Cunningham, genealogy specialist par excellence, to show me what I'd mi missed. And he has, I suspect, also edited the records since I last searched. Using the exact and sounds like search options, pulled together Kuwelti, Kuwelts, Kuwelte, and Kowalty. Now here, I've done a general search for Gottlieb Engelbach, the music reviewer of Ackerman's Repository of Arts. But since I've seen his last name spelled several ways, I've used wildcards to, uh, to cast the widest possible net. At the head of the results is a family tree. You need to be very careful with family trees as most are unsourced and provide no citations or supplied information. They might be correct, but you'll have no way of confirming that. I always check when trees pop up in a search just because some folks have already done a lot of the work I would have to have done myself. In this case, almost all of the facts are supported with links to their records in Ancestry, and you can navigate directly to the record in question to confirm the facts. You can go forward and back in the individual's genealogical tree to see if fathers or sons have the same names or identify other pitfalls. You'll notice that they don't include a firm death date up at the top in this tree. And in fact, the record within the tree itself also does not have correct information. This is a good example of why you always want to find more than one record to support birth and death information. In this case, further research revealed that this guy actually died June 1st, 1852 in Darmstadt, Hesse. Sometimes there are enough links in well-sourced family trees to satisfy my rule of three, and I don't even have to take the time searching individual records. But caveat emptor. As an example of some more experimental searching that is possible within Ancestry, let's say I have a dedicatee that I'd like to research, but all I have is a first name and perhaps a last initial. Now we know that in Ancestry, wildcards only work with three letters, not initials. So I'll only search the first name. The waltz is copyright 1850, and I know the composer was living in Circleville, Ohio at that time. I searched the first name Jesse directly in the 1850 US Census, limiting to Circleville. As you will have already noted, there is a lot of guesswork to this kind of searching. And if you make the wrong guess at the beginning, you can really go down a rabbit's hole. But just take a deep breath and start over again with a new guess. Jesse was a common nickname for Jeannie at this time. And here we see an example of how Ancestry fills in nicknames and similar spellings. The last name begins with M and Miss McQueen is very close to the composer's age. Checking the actual census records for each of them and Google Maps, I discovered that they also live quite close to each other. More research is obviously needed to confirm, but this gives us a possible starting point, which otherwise would be completely impossible. The Learning Center provides several useful guides to some of the most problematic searching areas and is well worth reading through if you're looking for more challenging individuals. I would particularly recommend reading through the guides on African American and German searching tips. I had no idea, for instance, that Ancestry provides an entire freely available simplified searching interface to their exclusively African American records. The search page for the African American interface includes a search area and paging down you will find a lot of other valuable search tips. Content warning here, some of the vocabulary choices in these records, as well as throughout African-American specific resources can be upsetting. 
The ancestry African American interface can also be tricky as it doesn't include many options to narrow down a search. But if your first attempt doesn't provide what you need, page down to the bottom of the search results to find an option to add more information. Tell us more about James. Here I've searched James A. Bland, composer of a lot of important songs, including Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. Let's forget for now that he's available in several biobibliographies and guess when he was born based on when his songs were published. Navigating through to what is behind this aggregation of data doesn't provide itemized data sources. But with what I have here, I can now go over into the general search in regular ancestry and see what is available there. In the general search, I put in his birth year and add initials to my exact search for his first name to catch records with both A and Allen as middle names. At the top of the search results is a family tree, which I examine first since it is clearly the correct guy. Not only is this family tree well sourced with several ancestry links supporting each fact, it includes another useful feature of the family trees, external links. In this case, several newspaper links concerning Bland, sometimes these links are proprietary. But you can copy the addresses out to access them through your library or through your local public library, etc. Moving beyond Ancestry just briefly, one resource I've found helpful as I've been learning about 19th century African American composers and performers is the International African American Museum Center for Family History. The IIAM includes significant resources with clear, concise explanations for use. In addition to fascinating blogs on a variety of subjects, many up-to-date links to other useful sites are also included. On the Google Doc, I've also provided a loose outline of the best records to search with links during different eras of African-American life in America. Grateful thanks are due to Deborah Downey for her kind help with this. The resources cover the early 20th century and the Reconstruction era, records generated during the period of slavery in America. Now I know there's an awful lot written in here, but it's all reproduced in the Google Doc. Records of those who were free during the slavery period in America and prior to 1800. I hope that I've given you at least an overview of how to search effectively in Ancestry. Just remember, the CART catalog with collection descriptions is your friend. Data can be incorrectly entered, so try not to take a single record as gospel. Wherever possible, apply the tried and true catalogers rule of three. Use the native fuzzy searching when you come up with nothing. It can be amazingly helpful. And now, in fear and trembling, are there any questions or comments? I'm sure that many of you have your own useful experiences to share. Thank you, Andrea. That was, that was, I'm I, here. I had not um, ever tried Ancestry, so I'm very eager to um, to give it a shot. That's interesting. Um, okay, at this point, I just wanted to make a quick uh, clarification that no one else is on screen right now. I can't see anyone else's video, but if you click the button that says share audio and video, it's up at the, usually up at the upper right corner, it's a blue button it will put you in a queue at the bottom of my screen. I won't actually see you, but I'll see your name. And if you are interested in asking a question, um, you may either use the three. Um, so Mark, go ahead and click your share thing. Uh, you can use the three question marks or you can type your question into the uh, Q&A. Use the Q&A section in the right column and we will do our questions and answers there. Okay.
So I'm waiting for Mark to queue himself up. But I guess before then, um, uh, Suzanne Lovejoy has a question or a comment actually. Is just I found my great grandfather David listed in the 1880 census under his nickname Daisy, so I guess you have to use some really fuzzy searching to get that. There's Mark. Okay, we're gonna promote Mark to the screen. This, and everyone watch. This is how it works. Okay, so Mark asked to share his uh, his video and audio, and I'm gonna click him on right now. And he should appear. I don't sound like a chipmunk, do I? Oh. Hi, Mark. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of clicking you have to do to get to this point, by the way. It asks about microphone and, and um, camera and all this kind of stuff, just so you know. I really don't have questions, but I have some comments because I use Ancestry.com a whole, whole, whole bunch. Um, when during the pandemic, I was using it for maybe several hours a day because of a, because my pandemic activity was authority work. Uh, so one comment is that when you're using these sources, you need to be aware of what sources will be excluded if you specify a date that you're looking for. And I'm thinking of partic in particular directories. Directories have been a really, really helpful um, resource. But if you try to specify a birth or death date, they won't make it into your results. Um, Another thing is when you're uh, evaluating records, um, you might think that some of the best records would be records where people have to provide the information and sign off on it directly, like, uh, for example, draft records uh, for men and other kinds of things, but also be aware of situations in which people might lie about their age. In the draft records, a guy might have uh, made himself a little older so that he would be able to be eligible. Um, and um, Andrew mentioned the uh, problem you may come up with is some of these newspaper sources that you may get led to are proprietary. Uh, do keep in mind, though, that at least some of the platforms, um, newspapers.com in particular, will offer an OCR way of, of when you get to something, you know, it looks like you've got to sign up. But if there's a little tiny link that says OCR, and if you press that and then use control F to do your search, if the if it was able to transcribe the thing properly, it will you'll get it. And it, you know, you may have to sort of futz around and jump be around, but it's the data's there. Okay, I'll shut up now. Thank you, Mark. Wonderful comments. And uh, if anyone else has comments uh, of the same, I think our experience much of what was in my presentation is not included in uh, the, the mostly excellent guidance that you can find in the Learning Center. Uh, but it's exactly things like Mark uh, commented on that really help us to, to hone our uh, abilities in this area. Because um, what, what he was saying about directories, that's a, 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 a superb point. Um, and I uh, simplified all of this just so that people would not be overwhelmed with thousands of records, be, which can happen if you don't specify dates. But again, look through all the information about what you're searching so you know what what is going to be there and what is not going to be included. That's very important. I lied. There's one more thing I want to say that when you go out on the larger web and you take this information that you found out, you go out, one of the things that you now want to keep in mind is that a lot of this stuff is self-referential. So, for example, if you go to find a grave, yeah, those those are going to be constructed largely based on things in ancestry you got Tom, or even things you see in Wikipedia or whatever. In other words, um, you have to sort of you have to sort of uh, exercise some skepticism. There are yeah. there are sources like Discogs and things that people just worship up and down. And I found that in terms of dates of people, they're wrong. Yeah, no, so, no, that's, yeah. that's absolutely true. Uh, and I frequently go from uh, this site into Google Google Books or some some uh, searching Hathi Trust to see if there is any documentation to be found elsewhere um, before I go into the to the wide wide web. And you just you have to be careful about everything. Uh, another thing I'll add too, I, I did a lot of work with uh, 17th through 19th century um, English 
prints because I was doing uh, authority work on English short title catalog records. And the cataloging, remember that until our current time, the cataloging would routinely tell you to exclude anything, titles, uh, degrees, residences, even junior from the transcription of a name. So if you can get to an electronic version of that and actually see what's there, uh, sometimes you'll learn a whole bunch of stuff that will actually let you get, let you find what's going on. Particularly if it says, um, yeah, you know, they were the printer to the king or they lived in Lambeth or whatever, or, or have initials of their professional associations. All right, I really will shut up now. How do I, how do I, how do I make myself go away? Oh, I will, I will kick you out of the room if you don't okay. want to leave. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. You bet. And thanks, now, Andrea. Now, does anyone Do else have anything that they want to chime in on or comment or Let me see. Uh, we have a couple of more comments or questions. Uh, okay. Peter Lysias asks, uh, to clarify, is this a source to which an individual or institution must be subscribed or is it free? Oh, no. The African American interface is free and available everywhere, as far as I can tell. Uh, the Ancestry Library Edition, you have to pay, and I understand it's it's not cheap. Um, you can also join as an individual, which actually gives you quite a few more options. Um, but I'm not familiar with the, with the subscription levels there. OK. All right, thanks. Uh, another anonymous comment. Um, our only area access to the library edition is on-site only at the largest public library systems. Um, I think that's because they are, like like Andrea said, it's not cheap to um, yeah. subscribe to these. So they probably are only available in the larger places. Um, Jeff says, when citing Ancestry in a name record in a 670, would you provide any other information that the date then the date you access the data on Ancestry, and of course the data you found in subfield B. Now, Mark, Mark may have uh, uh, another way of dealing with this, um, and which uh, absolutely would be better than anything I suggest. But the way I provide information in my authority records is I give uh, at the at the beginning of the subfield A, I give the complete name of the uh, the collection from which I have taken it. The uh, eight, you know, the 1841 English census, whatever, however it is worded in Ancestry, comma, via Ancestry.com, comma, accessed, and then the date that I've accessed it. Then I start the subfield B with an open parentheses and provide the information that I think is necessary. Oh, now Mark has another question. He actually wants to come on screen again. All right, Mark, we still have time for you, so I will promote you to be on screen just a second there you go okay well i mean you know I'm, uh i got invoked so what, what can i do you got um, invoked absolutely you're the expert here. I, I do what andrea i do what andrea does and for some sources uh i have started getting a little more um involved in the within the parentheses so for example if i mean if i'm doing a census thing i will say 1850 united states federal census blah 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 and then once I get into the parenthetical part, I will say, I'll, I'll follow the trail at the top. Uh, Minnesota, Hennepin, Minneapolis, district, whatever. I don't go so far as to say what page it is for the census records, but um, at least you know point where you would get or, or uh, the same kind of thing would, for the military records. So I, I do kind of provide a little bit of an equivalent of the click trail that I advise yeah. people to do. Um, yeah, I, I, do, I would do the same thing. I think it's I important not, to, I'm sorry, that, but I just want to point out, I, I do not do a subfield view for the URL because it is a proprietary resource. Yeah, I don't either. And it's incredibly long and, and impossible to reproduce for those of us who can't see. Um, but I, I totally agree with you, Mark. I include that too. I, I include that 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 uh, breadcrumb trail up at the top of the, of the screen um, before the open parens in the subfield B. I think that what we provide in an authority record should allow someone to go back into this and and uh, this file in uh, if they're doing it in a, in a document form rather than in in the ancestry online form and be able to reproduce what we found and um, I will say that there are, when you get into the um, 
Oh, the 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 1993, whatever they were called it, the thing that's in two volumes, where it's just mostly addresses uh, and, and sometimes birth dates. I could I could see a situation where you cite the database and you you kind of go in and say, well, when you search this, you get this form and you get this form. So I uh, for for that I might be a little bit, I might be a little loosey goosey because because sometimes you can get a range of information on the same person based on when, you know, when the record was transcribed. Um, another thing too that I try to avoid is uh, giving specific addresses when I've used addresses to verify matches, particularly for people in the 20th century. And I would point out that some of these databases go up to 2019. So it's not That's just- That's a good old point. I, uh, that, uh, I, should, I wanna use. emphasize that because um, I, I work in the 18th and the 19th century and I often forget that we have to be a little bit more careful about the information we use and how we use it when we're dealing with people who are still alive. So thank you, thank you for pointing that out, Mark. Okay, I'm ready to go away again. Thanks, Mark. Okay, I'm kicking <laughs> Thanks, you out. Mark. Um, we had one. I mean, Tom. Tom asked about uh, pearls, but we are, you've already addressed using URLs in the record. Um, I guess they're not very friendly, and it, yeah, you, like you said, it's proprietary. Um, someone asked the question: Are the chats? Is a chat feed being recorded? Okay, the chat feed is not being recorded on the video recording. Um, what happens is at the end, I will get a chat uh, report. It's just a giant spreadsheet with a million rows on it. And um, I'm not planning on doing anything with that. Uh, same with the q and I will probably try to pull out some of the questions and answers um, and make a document out of the ones that we addressed in this, um, or if there were any that came in afterwards, we, you know, I could send them along to Andrea, but um, I'm not, I'm not planning on posting the stuff except for selections of it. Um, so if you put something in the chat that is um, not something you want to be saved, it won't be saved. I won't, I won't publish it. All right. Um, well, we are, we have one minute until the end of the session. I think I don't see any other questions, so I, I want to thank Andrea um, for your great presentation. Oh, uh, Felicia says, comment on Mark's, uh, Mark Sharf's work on ESTC. I found that I found that addresses in the imprint area in pre pre eighteen hundred titles are very useful in disambiguating printers and sometimes in determining the date of printing. I understood about half of that sentence so i'm just gonna let it let you all who um deal with these uh types of resources um understand it okay so at this point um well thank you andrea um that was a, that was a fascinating and, and i th thank you for the document actually that i'm going to take a really good look at that um all right we are oh, going I, I, to Kevin, if oh, i could just interject one sure. more point if people find that there's information that they want to add to this document, uh, just ask me to, for access and I'll be happy to give it to you. And you can put in any, I, I put in um, uh, selected links, but there's certainly uh, room for more if anyone wants to put it in there. Okay, now I'm done. All right, Bye. thank you. Okay, so we have a break now. I'm gonna kick you off the screen, Andrea. All right, bye. Um, so at this point we have a break uh, until 15 after, uh, I think it's, it's probably like one something in, on the East Coast. It's it's 10.05 for me. Um, so I will see you all back in the next room. What you wanna do is go out to the sessions on the left column over there, which way am I pointing? And then um, click into the second room at, at uh, 1.15. All right, thank you all. I will see you soon.